So imagine you had a server somewhere. Let's kind of uh, draw a little server. And there was a user who wanted to log into that server from a remote location. So here you have a user and he wants to log into the server. Uh, typically what happens, and then one of the most common mechanisms by which a user can authenticate himself to the server is that he will, he will ask to log into the server and the server is going to basically prompt him for a username and password. It's going to say, what's your username and password? And this is something we should all be used to doing when, when we log into, let's say, our favorite website. Okay. And then after being prompted for a username and password, what's going to happen is, is the user will then supply this information and the server will typically um, have somewhere located in it. It might have a, let's say, a file. Uh, and the file will contain lists of usernames and passwords. And this is obviously a very naive scheme, but I'll talk about this in some more detail. So maybe it'll have a, a username and a password for that user. And then it'll basically uh, retrieve this information when it sees this username, and then it will cross-reference this username against the one in here and see if the passwords match. Okay, And if this password matches the password that was provided by the user, then the user is basically going to be allowed to connect to the server and go in and, and do more stuff on that server. Okay. Now, this scheme that I presented for you is, is actually quite simple. Actually, it turns out some people do implement it this way, which is not a good thing. Uh, and the reason for that, and the, the most, I think, noteworthy and glaring and concerning issue about the scheme I presented is that this file contains all these usernames and passwords. It's a highly sensitive file. And if an attacker, if somebody, some bad guy somewhere, is able to get his hands on this file, uh, he'll basically know every single username and password, and um, you know that would be quite bad. And so here's an interesting question to think about. The question is, is there a way to somehow validate passwords without ever directly storing passwords in such a compromising manner? In other words, um, you know, is it possible for the server to validate that a user belongs there, even, even by means of a password, without the server actually storing the password itself. Okay, and you may want to pause the video and think about this question for a bit uh, before I, I kind of tell you the answer. Uh, but what I can tell you uh, in the meanwhile, if you don't want to pause, is that this question, or maybe not quite this exact question, but certainly a question that was more or less uh, mathematically equivalent to it, although I've had some differences, uh, was actually posed to a guy named Michael Rabin. Um, and it was posed to him in 1958 um, by uh, John McCarthy. And um, basically, McCarthy and Rabin are legends in the field of computer science. And in fact, they've both gone on to win the Turing Award, which is the Nobel Prize in computer science, the Alan M. Turing Award. Uh, and actually, as an aside, I did have a bit of a a chance to, to meet Michael Rabin. He actually had invited me a number of years ago to give a lecture, a guest lecture in his cryptography course, and that was certainly uh, quite an incredible honor. And, and um, you know, he has made many, many contributions to the field of cryptography and to uh, computer science in general. Okay. Now, Rabin, uh, and actually, I should also mention McCarthy is really well known for, for his work in AI, and he's, he's done some really seminal work in that area. In fact, I think he coined the term artificial intelligence. So these guys, Rabin and McCarthy, really are uh, legends in their field. And Rabin came up with a very, very brilliant solution, in my mind, to this problem of password security. And what he basically observed is that imagine you had a mathematical function, and we're going to represent it by this box, okay? And let's say this function, this is maybe a set of mathematical transformations that you can apply to some input value. Imagine this function could take an input x, let's say it's going to take some input, and we'll call this input x, and it might compute some output y, okay? And suppose this function was such that it was easy to compute y given x via this function. Maybe it's mathematically or computationally efficient. But imagine this function um, is hard to invert. Okay, a function that's easy to compute in one direction but hard to invert. In other words, it would take an extensive amount of computational effort to come up with x given y, but it might be easy to come up with y given x. And if you recall, or if you've seen any of the videos I've made on cryptographic hash functions, you'll immediately realize that cryptographic hash functions, well-designed ones, do provide you with this type of property. And we call this property pre-image resistance. Pre-image resistance. And if you are interested, I've made a number of videos on cryptographic hash functions that you can take a look at. 
But really, for the purpose of this video, you don't maybe need all that detail. What you really need to understand about cryptographic hash functions is that the main property that we care about for password security is that for a given value x, a given input value x, it's easy to compute the hash of x, but for given just the hash itself, given the value y, it is hard to go in this direction. Going backwards, going to, going to x from y is hard, and it would take a lot of computational effort, too much to be uh, practical in any sense of the word. Okay? So imagine you had this kind of pre-image resistant function, and we'll call this function hash. Let's just call it h uh, to, to simplify things. Here's what you can do. Rather than storing the password directly in this file, imagine that instead of storing the password directly, what the file stored, it would store a username and it would store the hash, h of the password. So imagine you had a password, um, let's say the password was, uh, you know, uh, Bob1234, and this is not a particularly good password, but let's say that was your password and you applied the cryptographic hash function to it. You might get some really, you know, convoluted looking output like, you know, D01AB3, something like that. I don't know, just making this up. But obviously this looks nothing like the original input. And so what the server would store, instead of actually storing, in the past it would have stored Bob1234, but in the scheme that Rabin would have proposed, it would have stored this value D01AB3 instead. Okay? Now, the way the scheme works is when somebody tries to log in, they will still be prompted for their username and password. They can provide the username and password, but the server will take the password that's been provided. It will apply the hash function to the password, okay? And then it will see if that password, this hashed password rather, the hashed password matches the hashed password associated with that username. And if those two hashes match, if the hashed password provided by the user, or the hash of the password provided by the user, matches the hashed password that's stored in the password file, then we can be confident that the user actually provided the correct password. Okay, and the reason for that is that a cryptographic hash function um, has a number of properties, one of which is that it's highly unlikely for two distinct inputs to map to the same output which means that the input that the user provided indeed was the correct one, okay? And the real beauty of this approach, and I, I just you know, can't emphasize this enough, is that the server never, never needs to actually store the actual password. It just has to store the password hash. And when you think about it, you know, this fact is, is, is almost mind-bogglingly remarkable. Really, the server can validate that you have provided the correct password even though the server doesn't itself know the actual password. Okay, the nice thing is that now if the file containing the password hashes itself gets stolen, then you, you haven't really lost all the keys to the kingdom up front. You know, after all, a good hash function is pre-image resistant, which means that given just these images, D01, AB3, and images like it, you're not going to be able to see the inputs that led to those password, to that password hash. In other words, you're not going to be able to derive the password so readily or inherently easily given just the hash. Now, actually, I should actually clarify that a little bit. It turns out that this very simple password hashing scheme, at least as I've presented it to you right now, it does have some very important security issues when it comes to the actual practical implementation of a scheme like this. And so while the scheme of storing the password hash is you know, far better than just storing the password directly in plain text or in the clear, you shouldn't implement it as is because attackers actually have developed techniques to attack it. And I'll talk about some of those techniques uh, in the next video.